Hello, very warm welcome to the ninth edition of the Symposium Expanded Animation here at the University of Applied Sciences Upper Austria, Hagenberg Campus. My name is Jürgen Hagler. I am uh, the director of the Ars Electronica Animation Festival and professor here at the campus. Uh, it's a great pleasure to kick off uh, this Expanded Animation Symposium again. Uh, we have, uh, uh, unfortunately, this uh, challenging uh, circumstances and we cannot uh, do this with our audience. So this will be again an online uh, symposium as we did it already last year. So we have some guests invited to our studio at the campus Hagenberg, but you can only join us uh, online and you have also the possibility to uh, leave some questions in the chat. So, the Expanded Animation Symposium is uh, under the umbrella of the Ars Electronica Animation Festival since uh, several years. And the Animation Festival covers uh, a screening program, so if you are here in Linz, you have the possibility to see some uh, screenings, some selections of, from the pre-Ars Electronica category computer animation, which is actually the starting point uh, for uh, media arts in this uh, media art uh, competition, Prias Electronica, and is also a pillar for the Expanded Animation Symposium. Then there are additional uh, Deep Space uh, 8K uh, screenings. So we already had a, a screening today with Eric O. Tomorrow there will also follow some very exciting uh, Deep Space 8K presentations. In addition, you have the possibility to see some uh, installations, uh, selections from the award winners this year at the OK Center, and of course, there is uh, the Expanded Animation Symposium. So overall, um, screenings, uh, exhibitions, and more than 30 presentations. The symposium uh, started uh, in 2013 with uh, the overarching uh, or a very ambitious topic, mapping an unlimited landscape. So uh, I will introduce you briefly to the evolution of the Expanded Animation Symposium. It was originally designed as a one-day unique uh, event. We had a, a lineup with uh, 10 speakers. Uh, Susan Buckham was our keynote speaker on the topic pervasive animation. And we actually continued and addressed the topic exploring uh, the vastness of art theory and play. So we tackled uh, this uh, very interesting intersection between animation and game. A year later, we had uh, this opportunity to host uh, the Expanded Animation Symposium under the umbrella of the animation festival in conjunction with the pre-forum. This is the place where the winners, the Golden Nika winner and the Award of Distinction winners discuss with jury members discussing uh, their uh, projects actually. A year later we continued with uh, the topic The Alchemists of Animation, closed, connected to the yearly theme of Ars Electronica in 2016, Radical Atoms, The Alchemists of Our Time. A year later, uh, we started discussing the topic hybrid technology in animation. We invited uh, some guests uh, from the industry, but also from uh, research and uh, in conjunction with artists. We continued this uh, discussion uh, a year later in 2018 with the topic Interfaces in Motion. We had discussed uh, this topic with uh, these upcoming virtual reality interfaces as well as virtual productions. Uh, in uh, 2019, we presented uh, the anthology Mapping an Unlimited Landscape, a recap, cap, so to speak, uh, with uh, these first five, six editions. The topic was out of the box strong connected to expanded cinema, expanded animation, so going back to the roots of this initiative. Last year we tackled uh, the topic, the appeal of the analog, quite interesting because this was a virtual uh, conference, so to speak, and we uh, expanded uh, the conference to a three-day conference with uh, the University for Creative Arts with the conference Synesthetic Syntax, seeing uh, visuals, hearing sound, uh, seeing uh, 
uh, sound, hearing visuals. And uh, this is a, a conference that we will continue this year as well. This year we have the title Tectonic Shift. There is the main question, is there a, a kind of tectonic shift that we are facing now in production, in conception, but also in reception and distribution? So there are a couple of new things uh, evolving all the time. And the question is, is there a shift? Is there something that we can see now? Or is it a smooth transition as well? So uh, it's great to have overall uh, these uh, 30 presentations and we are really looking forward to see these contributions from so many people from the industry but also artists, positions and researchers. So thank you so much to all the speakers for their contribution. Such an event of course is not possible without a great, great deal of support. So I would like to mention my co-organizers Jeremiah Tibaus, Alexander Wilhelm, Wolfgang Hochleitner, Christoph Schaufler, Patrick Breuer, Houston Rodriguez. Thank you so much to Ars Electronica, to the University for Creative Arts for uh, this collaboration. And also uh, to all our partners, uh, Maxon and uh, of course uh, all these uh, sponsors that are supporting this great event. The uh, research group Playful Interactive Environment, Supertron, uh, the Förderverein FH Hagenberg, Alumni Club, FH Oberösterreich, Exis, Fronius and the Wirtschaftskammer Oberösterreich. Thank you to all the students that are supporting this event and also a special thank you to the trailer team for their fantastic trailer. It's great to kick off this symposium again under these uh, challenging circumstances and it's great to have Gerfried Stocker, Artistic Director, here with us. Thank you so much. Hello and a very warm and excited welcome also from my side to Expanded Animation. My name is Gerfried Stocker, I'm the Artistic Director of Ars Electronic and I have this wonderful opportunity to talk to you here from the Kepler Gardens. The Expanded Animation Symposium is a very important part of the annual animation festival and therefore a very important part of the annual Ars Electronica Festival. Computer animation in particular has been one of the defining topics of the pre-Ars Electronica, the big international award for computer art and digital art that Ars Electronica is giving out since 1987. And when we look back in these very early years when computer animation just was kind of becoming fashionable, where big expectations started that this sometimes would be a technology that could allow us to simulate reality. And when we look now at this whole vast universe of digital visual technologies, then we really see this uh, extremely interesting transformation and development. Now in the age of uh, artificial intelligence and all the new tools that are there to not only simulate reality, but actually to create, to invent realities that haven't been here before, we see on the one side this exciting technological development, but I would say we even much stronger see the very importance, the need for artistic contribution. We see how important it is to have the energy, the creativity, the inspiration of artists, exploring the possibilities of these tools, but also giving us opportunities to see these developments maybe with different perspectives. To not only see the possibilities, but to see the challenges and the problems. And this is what the whole Ars Electronica Festival is about. This is what we are talking this year under the title, a new digital deal in so many areas of the festival. And I would really like to use this opportunity to thank Jürgen Hagler, his exciting team at the Fachhochschule, at the Upper Austrian Fachhochschule, in particular the partners in Hagenberg and all the other people that are working with him for their energy, for their contribution and for this really wonderful long-term collaboration that uh, we have been able to establish. It's an important part of our global international network and I'm very happy that just uh, a few kilometers out of Linz we have such a strong partner here as well. 
So thanks uh, to the organizers, thanks to Jürgen and to all the visitors here. I hope you are really enjoying this program. Thank you. Hello and welcome. Um, I would like to give you a brief overview of the panels of the next days and the contents we have to share in the stream. And first of all, you s maybe see this um, program here and we can switch to it. We start today with the artist's position and this panel contains talks of outstanding artists who will talk about their uh, remarca remarkable work and their motivation and passion and why they do all the things they do. We starting this with Sine Ötzbilge, who will also be here live in the studio and talk with Jürgen after the talk. Tomorrow is a pretty long day with our main topic this year's main topic is tectonic shift, like Jürgen mentioned already. And we have three long panels uh, that will negotiate the difficulties and changes that the pandemic brought to the animation and VFX industry and how this influenced the workflows for the artists. But also we will talk about paradigm shifts within technology and this will be discussed, discussed from artistic perspectives and uh, so the, song, the changing of methods uh, like procedural design. We have three panels with different perspectives on this main topic. Yeah, and on Sunday we also have a full pack program uh, with synesthetic syntax um, that this symposium extension, so to say, um, presents researches and experiments within the field of audiovisual creation in a very broad manner. One thing I would like to mention very much is the pre-forum, which normal wise opened our symposium, but out of time schedule issues, it is now placed in the middle of the Sunday, 15.15 15 or 3 p.m. 15 at our place, um, there is a calculator in on our program that you can find on the uh, homepage um, that can calculate which time this means for you, depending on your place. So, the pre-forum will be uh, presented by the Oscar nominee Eric O, who is a well-known uh, artist at the Ars Electronica 2. And he will talk to the prize winners in the Ask category, Computer Animation, and will reflect with them on their awarded works. It's highly recommended and one of our favorite panels we can show you. Yeah, so have fun and now a talk with Sine Ötzbilge. audiovisual director and visual artist. Oftentimes I collaborate with my artistic partner and sister Inge Özbilge. Together we work as each other's mirrors, experimenting with the medium of animation, the 16 to 9 screen, digital installation art and the use of mixed media. While doing so, we explore new connotations and stylistic forms. Just as we create in a duo, we also lead separate artistic practices. Today, I will give insights to my personal artistic oeuvre, which revolves around research that questions and seeks out artistic possibilities, which arise in the post-net limbo that lies between our real physical worlds as well as cyberspace. To give you more insights, I would like to start with an introduction of where I see us as a species in the current zeitgeist and explain why this is important in contemporary art practices today. 
The online living culture that we, as the 21st century Homo sapiens digitalis, have welcomed with open arms, has become seriously rooted in our existence. We would think that life had always been this way, that it is normal that we use devices and the internet for almost everything in our daily lives. We wake up staring at our phones, continue our workday on computers, and end up watching movies on a screen in the evenings. We might say this is a personal choice, yet this digital infrastructure has creeped into nearly all of our essential needs, making it impossible to function without technology and rendering this an obligation rather than a choice, really. Nowadays, for instance, at some cafes or restaurants, you cannot consume anything unless you own a smartphone with a Payconic app. This can prevent some people from ordering their drinks or food, as they might not have the know-how on installing an app, let alone on a smartphone. It's, it might sound strange, but it is still the reality for some people. This issue seems to be of concern to many of us. For example, the curator Omar Khalif, in his book Goodbye World, Looking at Art in the Digital Age, describes the struggles he faces with digital services while waiting for his flight at an airport. He narrates similar situations, while also questioning what this means and how far machines will and are replacing human labor as well as interaction. And what happens when machines fail us? Since the onset of COVID, cash is being eradicated, education is becoming monopolized Half data digitized and many more changes are currently being established, which transform each one of us into ephemeral digital beings whose existence literally depends on the service of digital providers and privatized companies. Without your LinkedIn, you cannot apply to certain jobs. Without your bank apps, you cannot pay your rent. Without your identity app, you cannot access your bureaucratic documents, apply for a visa, or receive a COVID certificate to travel. You can actually not function. While the use of such technology might feel intuitive to Generation Y and Generation Z, the architects of the system, Generation X, is already starting to lag behind. However, if we look back on how our current cyber culture has evolved, we will realize that this phenomenon is surprisingly young. The internet as we know it exists merely for approximately three decades. Yet its influence on our physical world and physical bodies is immense. For example, Christina Criddle technology reporter at BBC News writes about the Cambridge University research that analyzes the real-world energy consumption of the cryptocurrency Bitcoin. The data suggests that this digital currency burns more electricity than the entirety of Argentina. Energy that derives mostly from coal, so real physical matter, is translated into digital capital. There is also new research on the impact of the technological devices that we use on our cognitive behaviors. Simply put, research on how our interaction with cyberspace is altering the way we organic humans perceive and synthesize digital content. Pressure inflicted online has often real psychological or physical effects, from bullying trolls to cyber attacks on companies and private citizens. Furthermore, people tend to act differently in virtual spaces than in physical spaces, while the effects of both are equally challenging. On top of this, researchers Yunko Yamamoto and Simeon Ananu state in their publication Humanity in the Digital Age, Cognitive, Social, Emotional and Ethical Implications, that the increased use of online social networks, text messaging and email can collectively result in decreased face-to-face -face interaction. This may in return also result in less empathy and the loss of interpersonal bonding. Imagine the devastating outcomes of a society without empathy. So in short, 
our actions in what I call the digital hemisphere have an undeniable real-time effect on our physical world. And this effect is changing the way we exist and what we are. It is natural to assume that in this case, art itself is also intrinsically affected by the digitalization of our lives. In the introduction of the anthology No Internet, No Art, Melanie Bühler explains that in our present era there can be no art that is not somehow connected to or reliant upon the internet. She says even when artists are not working with digital technologies as their primary medium, these technologies are nevertheless involved in the process of producing, disseminating and or selling an artwork. Be it that the materials were sourced on eBay, Wikipedia was consulted for research and an assistant retouched the documentation in Photoshop or the gallerist posted images of the work on Instagram. She started the Lunch Bites anthology in 2011. Since then, her as well as other professionals in the art domain have furthered their inquiry into this subject. As I mentioned before, the conquests of the internet over the physical world is progressing at the highest speed level. In the past 10 years, the art landscape has most definitely changed further and has engulfed itself far deeper into the deep webs of cyberspace. And this change is continuing at an accelerated pace, rendering it important for us to ongoingly investigate the millions of new phenomena that arise from it. While academics look into research from a strongly theoretical and factual perspective, I believe artists are often acting upon their intuition and gut feelings. We tend to discover things along the way while playing and experimenting, oftentimes without exactly knowing what we are looking for. My own experimental practice has paved the way to my own research in this field while bringing forth projects that I have enjoyed immensely. I will now introduce a few of these and explain their link with the subject at hand. A project where the influence of the digital on the human existence is observed and researched through artistic practice is my animated short film Hashtag 21XOXO, co-directed by Imge Özbilge. Hashtag 21XOXO is an experimental animated short film that reflects on the impact of 21st century technologies on intimacy, love and relationships. It revolves around the nihilistic, narcissistic and millennial adventures of a girl in a parallel digital universe, interlaced with cyber love, speed dating, hipster culture, meme and vaporwave aesthetics, as well as postnet attitudes. Absurd, surreal and metamorphic scenes of digital nonsense intertwine with 90s nostalgia, design culture, femininity, the subconscious and pop art in order to paint a picture of today's zeitgeist. It has a mixed media basis where animation and live action fuse in order to explore new connotations and stylistic forms generating sublayers, open endings and distorted realities. While making this film, I was greatly fascinated by the way we navigate and interact with social media. I found a study conducted by researchers at the University of Science and Technology of China, which reveals that social media has a major impact on university students. They state that the excessive use of social media leads to an overload of information and increases techno stress as well as exhaustion. Techno stress refers to the stress derived from the use of information technology. The great number of digital stimuli, information as well as communication overload is a new phenomenon that did not exist in the pre-internet times. In the official journal of the World Psychiatric Association, they talk about how internet usage directly impacts our brain's grey matter as well as neuroplastic mechanisms. They lay out how the current digital tools 
In connection to the internet, encourage interaction with multiple inputs at the same time, on a shallow level. This is called media multitasking, and it is negatively altering our brain structure. During the making of hashtag 21XOXO, I found myself intuitively experimenting with the editing of the trippy nightmare sequence. In a similar way, to how we tend to scroll down on our social media feeds, or how we switch from one post to another, swipe on Tinder and cruise on Instagram. This resulted in the creation of a continuous yet extremely fragmented visual experience. The more I started looking theoretically into my intuitive editing choices, the more I realized that we as audiovisual creators are adapting to this shift in cognition as well. I believe that we are currently developing new forms of cinematography that no longer align with past movements and theories. A cinematography that reflects our current digital lifestyles. Contemporary video clutter, media-related filmic aesthetics, are infiltrating our everyday lives through social media and technological gadgets resulting in visual output such as fisheye lenses, Skype angles, GoPro footage, Instagram cadrages, and much more. I had much fun integrating these into the scenes of my film, filtering them through the language of animation. As this kind of application is considerably new, there is also not a lot of research done around this subject, especially in the field of animation. Yet, artists as well as students from all over the world are subconsciously embedding these elements in their work. Just in the last master's jury this summer at KASK, the Royal Academy of Arts in Ghent, I witnessed another interesting execution of this. One of our students had reconstructed an animated scene, imitating a recording of a solar eclipse taken with a smartphone. Besides the specific camera angle and cadrage, she had also used frame-by-frame -frame watercolor texture to imitate the shaking of the handheld smartphone camera. And she combined this with sound design to enhance the effect. So actually she used a material, watercolor, to reproduce a digital effect and a digital sense emotion. We are intrinsically trying to recreate these digital cognitive elements in our experiences as artists. 
After XOXO, I developed a curiosity for post-cyber feminism, coming across a 2019 published edition of the exhibition Producing Futures from the Migros Museum of Contemporary Art. Thanks to this book, I made acquaintance with the artists that are building upon the legacy of the cyber feminists of the 90s. Certainly a fascinating movement, as it addresses the effects of digital actions on societal structures. The prophecy of the cyber feminists of the 90s was that the internet would liberate us by dismantling hierarchies as well as structures of power, sexism and discrimination. To what extent this has come true is of course debatable. While some improvements have certainly taken place, the virtual has simultaneously created or at times augmented other issues that need to be addressed. The post-cyber feminists therefore use the term post as they are reconstructing their predecessors movement while adapting it to the current time frame. These readings gave birth to my ongoing investigative project, the Uterine Cyber Parturition, in which I envision an alternate parallel where the internet fosters her consciousness through the act of creation, regaining universal vision and liberating herself from the shackles that were imposed upon her. I create a cyber myth centered around the internet, whom I render female in this case. 
This myth enables the investigation of gender-related symbolism. In Western culture, as well as in other cultures, there are traces of misogynist remains in almost all imaginable domains. Many artists and activists are trying to dismantle this gender-biased legacy in order to create a more wholesome and harmonious society, which also is accepting of any person, no matter their gender or sexual orientation. This misogynist legacy, however, is deeply interwoven in our cultures and is in urgent need of reconstruction. In English lingua, for instance, a commonly used expression for the lack of courage is linked to being female. David Shariatmadari, writer and editor at The Guardian, wrote an article in 2016 on sexism in language, pointing out that the word rabbit was, according to the dictionary publisher, described as feminist. He wrote that the publisher had been criticized for a sexist bias in its illustrations of how certain words are used. Nagging was followed by wife. Grating and shrill appeared in sentences describing women's voices. Luckily, today these terms have been adjusted. Other examples can be found in the medical jargon used in textbooks which is still heavily based on outdated terminology. The term hysterectomy, for instance, is still related to the women-specific made-up mental illness hysteria. In the past, it was believed that removing the uterus would cure hysteria. While this fake illness was removed from the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in 1980, the term hysterectomy is still used for the operations of the removal of the uterus. Definitely a term in urgent need of reformation. This list can go on, but I think I've pointed out the issue. The story of the uterine cyberpartition, in short UCP, empowers the female by using female organs in a celebratory fashion. Just as Donna Haraway, the inspirational author and professor of the cyber-feminist movement, uses the cyborg as a means to deconstruct gender stereotypes in societies and to reconstruct new, liberated beings, I make use of the UCP as a cyber-mythical tool of investigation and celebration. The reason to construct a myth as a tool is linked to Joseph Campbell's theories, the author of The Power of Myth. He points out the ability for myths to incorporate the beliefs of a whole society and to provide the mythology to unify a nation. Apart from post-cyberfeminism's attempt to recode society through the digital hemisphere, I've also experimented with the practical part of the UCP. This part involves the creation of physical objects. I have created various so-called cyber artifacts for this project that serve as proof of the existence of my myth. The uterus that I've designed for the UCP has been modeled through a VR headset using a VR sculpting program. This means that I sculpted its form with the movements of my own physical body and physical hand gestures, but in a virtual space. My analog movements were translated into digital code. Later on, I 3D printed my sculpted piece with a 3D printer, bringing it back to the physical, real space. However, this time the uterus was filtered through the 3D printer's printing algorithm. So that means that my work went through four stages. First physical, then two times digital, and finally one more physical stage in order to become the artifact that represents the UCP. And this transformative behavior of the sculpted uterus actually sums up my topic for this artist talk, as it is a literal representation of how physical elements enter cyberspace and how 
cyber elements are introduced or affect things in the physical world. And eventually how this can and is becoming part of art making in the current era. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sina, for this fantastic uh, presentation. It's great to have you here in uh, Hagenberg at the studio, and it's also great to have Remco, the sound designer, here uh, with us. And uh, yeah, so let's start with uh, the Q&A for the audience. So if you want to address a question, just uh, leave a message in the chat, and I can read it to you, and we can discuss it. So. Sina, it's uh, uh, quite interesting uh, to see that uh, sisters are working together. Brother Squay is something that came to my mind when uh, I saw your work the first time. Uh, it's, uh, uh, she couldn't make it, but uh, you are collaborating uh, since a couple of years. Uh, this is, I think, uh, the second or uh, third uh, animated shorts that are you working together with your sister. Mm -hmm. This is uh, quite challenging, or is it uh, uh, easy? So how do you collaborate? Uh, in the beginning, is there a concept that you do together? How, how do we do that? Yeah, um, firstly, thank you for having us. Uh, it's very exciting to be here. Um, Inge couldn't make it, but uh, she's also very happy to be part of Ars Electronica, as it's also the second year. Um, so the collaboration that we have is mostly, so far, it was that we would write the um, stories separately and also create the artistic uh, world separately, but we would co-direct. So during production, um, we were making sure that we are each other's um, sparing partner and uh, support partner in it. Uh, currently, we are working on a project that we are completely writing by ourselves together this time, and we are merging our visual worlds as well. So, exciting times ahead. So, is this um, totally different? Because uh, for uh, hashtag uh, uh, 21XOXO, uh, you wrote uh, the script and then uh, uh, Imke uh, joined the production, so to speak. Indeed, and yes. uh, um, Mosaic, it was kind of vice versa. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. um, hashtag 21 XOXO is more um, visually from my side, uh, from the experimentation and also the story. But Mosaic is definitely Imke's uh, story and um, visual world as she is uh, specialized in Middle Eastern mythologies and miniature art. So you can also see that a lot in the um, way she creates characters. But uh, the co-directing, so the choosing of how we're going to film it and how we're going to animate it, uh, that part we do always together. So for the audience, I have a tip. Tomorrow there is a Deep Space presentation where you can see uh, Mosaic and uh, hashtag 21XOXO uh, in a huge resolution on a large screen. And yeah, you actually got an award of uh, a honorary mention for, for both last year and yeah. this year. Uh, I was uh, joining the jury when they discussed uh, uh, last year uh, the, the project, uh, the animated short, uh, hashtag uh, 21XOXO. Uh, so uh, it was really uh, fantastic to see uh, this, uh, this story from uh, uh, this perspective and uh, very fresh, uh, unique uh, animation. So congratulations to, to both uh, projects. I was uh, curious about uh, uh, this... Uh, um, the importance of your story. So in both uh, um, projects, uh, you have different writers, so to speak. Uh, you have a different uh, uh, artistic um, practice in, in your bio. Uh, I saw that uh, you are uh, more interested in feminism and mm -hmm. cyber aesthetic, and Imker is more 
uh, interested uh, in uh, psychological matters? Is this something that uh, is um, fluid, uh, or is it really like like uh, you wrote in in your bio? Uh, it is quite like that. Um, since our childhood, we we create because our mother is a painter, and we always had like. A, always something creative and we would express ourselves with um, drawings for instance and uh, I would definitely say that it's true that uh, Imge is reflecting on the societal uh, matters while I really look more into the psychological things and you can you can see that um, kind of in the short films as well because in hashtag 21xoxo it's the in internal journey of a young girl uh, who is looking for love actually in digital times, and in mosaic, it's um, it's the uh, reflection of a societal uh, issue, and it's concentrated on the Middle Eastern cultural richness, basically. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and uh, in the new film, it's titled "The Curator." Okay. Uh, we want to bring these two uh, ways of researching of psychological and societal together, and we will see what comes out of it. You mentioned that this is a, um, a quite interesting approach uh, in this interactivity. So it, it will be a, a short film, but also some. Uh, you, you are experimenting with some uh, different forms. Yes. So it's 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 an upcoming project. Can you give us a, an insight into what you are actually planning to do? Yes. Um, so uh, we were given often from festivals and valuable curators curators the feedback that our films are very rich in research and that they sometimes like to watch it again because we hide so much information in character design or something in the back. Um, and then we realized, wow, we're just working with this linear medium, the short film, which just gives you something of approximately 15 minutes uh, and it's like an experience in a cinema but we have so much more research and the world around these stories that we want to also share that. So now we are working uh, for the curator on a 360 project that's called, or a satellite project, uh, which will encompass also a game um, and maybe museum installations as well. We will see how far we will expand it. And uh, the interesting thing is uh, you can really play with narration in a game uh, because it's not linear and you can give the audience really the option to choose what they're going to observe first and how they come to the resolution. It's great to hear this uh, and we are looking forward uh, to see this project. <laughs> this uh, is quite interesting uh, uh, in, in terms of what is first. So uh, I, I know some uh, projects in the past we have already discussed uh, for instance David O'Reilly's piece uh, and he's also in this fringe of uh, animation and games as well. So it's my question is, uh, uh, what is first? As you are a filmmaker, are you starting with a traditional storyboard and animation and then think about activity and uh, non-linear uh, things? Is this uh, in the flux? Is this something that, that you still have to do to research? Very good question. <laughs> um, I think we will try to do it simultaneously. So far we did it, we have already everything ready for the short film. So that's hopefully will go into production in a year, depending on funding possibilities, of course. But we also have the pre, um, like the application for the prototype ready for the game. Uh, we did it together because it's important to question both media's possibilities. And sometimes if you uh, do just a game from a film, for instance, you can really um, not give uh, all the credit to the game that you are making because actually a game is different. Often there are films uh, from whom they make a game, but the, it's the same story, for instance, and it doesn't really go fully into the potential. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think I will be able to answer this better in a few months when we're really diving into it. And by the way, I love David O'Reilly, so it's great to hear that. There, there are a couple of uh, great examples. We had a, a, a presentation today with uh, Eric O, mm -hmm. and this is a, a, a huge uh, a tableau, also um, a kind of uh, expansion of uh, filmmaking, so to speak. Yeah, and it's a similar approach, and he also mentioned 
thinking about uh, interactivity and uh, this, this is obvious, so quite interesting question. Remku, you are the sound designer for yes. uh, hashtag uh, 21XOXO, so can you give us an uh, um, insight into your approach and also maybe thinking about uh, together about uh, interactive sound design? Uh, yeah, so what was interesting for uh, that project is that I kind of did the sound design and the music a bit at the same time. Actually, I started more with sound design because Sina uh, already had this idea in her head to have like these uh, social media sounds to use those in some sort of way. So I started with doing some research and just uh, looking for some of those social media sounds and getting like a database of these sounds and trying to see what I could do with them. And then I started making some musical sketches on what uh, I, the, the project back then was still in early stages, I think, but I had like a, some clues on what kind of style I would want to uh, make to the, to fit the, the narrative. And uh, then I, I just made a lot of sketches and then together with Cine we looked like what could work for diff what different parts. And then once we settled a bit on which ones to use, I expanded those further. Uh, and I, I think a lot of, uh, there's so, so there's like the music, but a lot of the sounds uh, of things that appear in the background or like scene transitions are, are also already incorporated in the in the soundtrack. So uh, that was kind of interesting to do, to like make like a combination of the soundtrack and the sound design in uh, one track. Uh, and then there's like the whole the track in the more trippy scene, which is like a very rhythmic track, more like a clubby track, which was also very uh, challenging for me to do in the beginning because it was uh, I had to do like the sound design with all everything going on, and then also match the whole structure to the to the uh, edit of the film so that it fits with every transition, which was quite challenging with like the very rhythmic uh, structure of that uh, song. But uh, it was really fun to do. Yeah, it was just great because in XOXO we experimented a lot and he also works experimental so we could together discover what the possibilities are. It was a great collaboration. Yeah, it was, it was basically a lot of fun to do and yeah. I, uh, I had uh, mostly what I used was like this uh, Roland uh, Gino 60 uh, synthesizer and I just uh, made almost uh, every sound with uh, th just the synthesizer, but it was really fun to just see what I could get out of the synthesizer. Uh, and it, the sound quit f uh, was quite uh, fitting with the movie, I think, mm -hmm. and also the aesthetic. Uh, so yeah, it was really fun to explore. It's the same challenge uh, for sound designers uh, as for animators and filmmakers. Uh, if you go the next step, interactive environments uh, 360, how to handle uh, sound, sound design, music, uh, because it's uh, linear and then it's interactive yeah. or even uh, in a 3D space, uh, then it's really a lot of uh, things to, to consider. And yes, challenging. and also actually for the next project, uh, the game, I will also be uh, looking into doing the sound design and the music, which will also be a new challenge to see how uh, we can use sounds interactive and in a, in, a, in a space and how to work that out. So. Yeah, indeed. I was just refreshing uh, the, the stream, so uh, if you have any questions, so we're still discussing uh, some other topics, we'll just leave it uh, in the chat and I can address it uh, to you. I would also like to uh, talk about your uh, last project, uh, your current project. Um, uh, this is uh, already uh, kind of exhibited, um, but uh, it's not in the way you you thought about it. Or is it? How can you? Or can you give us an uh, um, uh, an insight how you would like to be uh, uh, uterine uh, cyber portrait be exhibited? So you have these uh, artifacts, uh, but you also have these cyber myth. How how should this be in a proper way exhibited? Yeah. Um, so the uterine cyber partition, it's, um, it's still an ongoing project, it's an investigation and I'm looking um, into the possibilities of creating a myth and the myth is centered around the internet that gives birth uh, to her own uterus and creativity. Um, I am 
currently looking at what the best exhibition uh, for this would be, if it can be an interactive installation where people can also make uh, uh, 3D objects and print them, because the artifacts, the 3D artifacts that I'm talking about are human-made, and they're kind of uh, the proof of the existence of the uterine cyber partition. Um, but uh, during the process I also had a great opportunity to showcase uh, one of the fragments of it uh, at the Denver Digerati in uh, Denver. Uh, it's an amazing um, art platform and festival. Uh, the festival is called Supernova with great curators and they selected it to show it at the Urban Expo screening. Uh, there is in the artist talk you can see an image, yeah. yes, an image from that. Uh, so they were extremely supportive and eventually um, the media company that rents the screens had uh, a bit of an issue because the orig original video footage had the uterus in it, uh, but they found that a bit um, too sexual or offensive and so we had to change it and I changed it into Ovaries in Disguise, <laughs> the title of the piece. Uh, which was eventually exhibited. The original text on the side screen was also saying that Freud is a sad man. Uh, that was translated to the weather is nice. So. Okay, quite interesting. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, but very important for you to have this um, gap between uh, or transitions between the digital and the analog. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in this case of this object you started uh, with uh, uh, a body movement, so to speak, uh, and then uh, at the end there is an object uh, that can be uh, touched in the in, a, in an exhibition. Uh, so this uh, kind of switch uh, between uh, cyber and real is this something that is uh, uh, important in your whole body of work? Uh, even if we think about uh, um, uh, hashtag uh, 21XOX, so there is also a transition between mm. the real and so this. Is this um, something that uh, is quite important in, in your whole world? Definitely. Uh, before hashtag 2020XOXO, there was my graduation film, The Three Link Circus, which was also a bit of a Meliesque uh, live action and drawing uh, mix. And I back then I already started um, looking into possibilities of reality games that come out of the combination of animation and live action. And now, of course, with the digital technologies, I'm continuing more into AR and 3D printing and still observing what it means that something is digital. Is it like an alternative reality? Uh, when is something tangible? Um, when I 3D print something, uh, I can touch it. Uh, what does that mean? Is it more real then? And, um, yeah, so for the, the U-turn cyber partition artifacts, I was I love contemporary art history and I I always appreciate the abstract expressionists that use their own bodies to paint. For instance, Pollock was doing that, his movements were translating into painting. And with this project it's the VR where you actually really sculpt in the virtual space um, with your own body movement. And then that is translated into digital data, but eventually again printed into the real yeah. physical world. As we are running out of time, uh, and there is no question, uh, I, I think I have to refresh it, but I, I don't think there is a question. I will address a last one. Uh, you mentioned in a talk that you gave with your sister last year, that you are very keen on characters uh, that are, uh, so to speak, uh, appealing and uncanny at the same time. Uh, this is a uh, case in, in uh, uh, EXO, mm -hmm. kind of in uh, the current uh, animated short as well. Is this uh, um, a very particular device of animation to have this possibility of this gap between uncanny and appealing? Um. This is definitely for hashtag 20XOXO the case. Uh, for other movies, we kind of tailor make the characters that should fit the uh, storyline. Uh, for instance, Mosaic has much more of an emotional uh, connection uh, with the characters. But in hashtag 29XOXO, it was 
um, on purpose supposed to be disturbing. Um, and that's why we, we used rotoscopy, but in a way that they, the characters didn't have eyes. Uh, they had like this um, uh, empty Photoshop texture when you looked into the eyes and the mouth. Uh, their speech was text-to-speech and our actresses had to really sync it while okay. acting for us. Yeah. So we really wanted to make people feel uncomfortable, uh, disconnected, but also intrigued about it. Thank you so much, Sina, for uh, this uh, great uh, insight and for uh, the fantastic presentation. Uh, also, thank you, Renko, for joining. Uh, uh, we had just had a, a little conversation on the sound yes. design, but thank you so much. Uh, we will continue with uh, the next uh, talk. Uh, Matthias Winkelmann will talk about uh, a current project, Rachel is Not Real, and he will uh, talk about uh, strategies uh, in uh, social media that he will use for uh, a uh, bot that is creating uh, meaningful images. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me here at Ars Electronica. Thank you, Jürgen. Thank you, Rodriguez, for inviting me to give a talk about a project I created last year, which is called Rachel is Not Real. Before I start talking about the project, I should probably introduce myself. My name is Matthias Winkelmann. I am a creative director and digital designer based in Berlin. The majority of my work happens more in the commercial sector of motion design and animation. I work with different clients all over the world, um, predominantly in combination with different studios. For example, I worked a lot with Microsoft uh, with a studio called Foam Studio that I ran in Berlin in the last years. And we created different kind of animations and social media content for Microsoft to show new features in their products or actually announce new products or also just create some nice animations for their social media content. I also work a lot with clients more in the design field to do branding and kind of help them sharpen their branding imagery. This is a project created for BASF, also with Foam Studio, where we created abstract artistic collages inspired by some of the sociological research that BASF has done within the company. In between, I also make more traditional animation films. Uh, for example, I did two films for Maxon in the last years. This one is called Influencers. And then the second one was called Versus, uh, about which I actually also talked at Ars Electronica a few years ago already. This was created at Man vs. Machine in London, where I worked before I moved to Berlin. And then the, the application of what I do or what we do as 3D designers is quite wide. It starts somewhere in motion graphics and motion design, um, also animation advertisement, but also even goes as far as like doing technological research for different companies, which is kind of interesting because it's something that's been happening more in the last years. Um, I've worked for Microsoft and Google in the last year to do some tech research, but for example, this was made for IKEA a couple of years ago together with Space 10, a think tank in Copenhagen. And it was a project where we basically aspired to design autonomously driving vehicles of the future, how we would like them to see to be more human, more friendly, more warm. When you work in motion design, you traditionally will work with TV channels um, um, as well from time to time. This is uh, some branding we did for ITV2 a few years ago at Man vs. Machine or um, the opening title of the film for production company that I created um, also a few years ago. And traditionally, you will do advertisement from time to time. So these are some pieces I did for Honda or another piece um, we did at Manvis Machine for Ilohas, it's a Japanese water company that also is more like kind of animation, very animation heavy, but more in the context of advertisement. Nike is a very frequent client for everyone who works in that field. Um, so from time to time, you have to animate some shoes. If I don't work for clients, I'm very interested in thinking about how our medium as motion designers evolves and, and what will be the next thing in a way, but also sort of critically examine with creative projects what we are actually doing as designers in, in our fast paced world today. And I think that curiosity was something that also led me into doing that work, but it's also something that has kind of 
been driving the, the, the industry and the community quite a lot because the community thrives from that evolution and from that new technology that is coming up and all these new things that are popping up all the time. And that is why I created Rachel is Not Real in the first place. It was on one hand an exploration of new technology, but then on the other hand also a critical examination of the technology we are using already and what kind of impact it has on the creative work we do. A little bit of a background to motion design or motion graphics, and I'm trying to keep this short, but uh, not everybody might be super familiar with the kind of work and that sort of niche industry that exists around it. But motion design, in a way, or motion graphics can be traced back to 100 years ago with, with movements like Absoluta Film or Cinema Pure, in which experimental filmmakers um, strive to create abstract animations that sort of reflect on an alternative reality outside of the commonly known film medium already. Then it really got more attention with the title design of the 70s, people like Saul Bass, who were really pioneers of the medium and, and kind of gave it a new platform. For me personally, it, it became very interesting and also age-wise with MTV in the 90s where music videos and also like just abstract 3D animation was really celebrated on the platform. Um, and this is also where I got into it. But back in the days, it was like music videos were several minutes long and yeah, either they could be animated or motion graphics, but also quite often it was like very stylized um, video shoots or film shoots and, and that still falls sort of in the section of motion design. When I actually practically started working in the industry, um, Vimeo was a big deal. Um, it was Everybody was sort of pushing their work on Vimeo and you try to publish a film once or twice every year and these films were like several minutes long. So you needed a strong concept and a narrative to keep people interested throughout the film and, and actually also kind of not just through the visual design and the images, but also tell a story or like at least an idea. With Instagram in the last years, especially, this has massively changed. The formats got shorter, the content has to be a lot more catchy and just like pulling people in. And it's not so much about a, a concept or narrative anymore, much rather of like visual eye candy that is just popping up on your feed. So that platform had a massive impact on what kind of work is created as well, not just for what kind of platform it is created, but it, it really mirrors back into the kind of work designers are creating today and TikTok is not really the new big thing yet for motion design but it's coming more and more and it just shows me that the medium will not stop evolving here it will always like try to adapt to the new platform or to the needs that clients have in a way generally you can say the average duration of animated design pieces has been constantly decreasing over the last years um, from like several minutes on, on MTV or Vimeo um, to just like maybe 10, 20 seconds on Instagram because these are the durations that work a lot better on that platform. And equally, it also addresses an, an, a similar phenomenon that, that I believe the attention span of the audience has been decreasing at the same time. People are not necessarily willing anymore to sit down and watch a long film over several minutes, but rather stop briefly while scrolling down their feet. And if it interests them, they might stick with it. And if not, they just continue scrolling downwards. And becoming aware of that development has made me start questioning the impact that social media has on the work that we do. Not even social media as such, but the platforms within social media, um, how they influence the work we do and how they influence what kind of creative decisions we make along the way. On one hand, social media is extremely important for any kind of creative work because it's a very fast way of sharing your work. And especially in the commercial design industry, social media is like the main platform right now that most people work towards. But then at the same time, that format has started to have such an impact on what kind of creative decisions we make as designers and artists that I'm, I'm sometimes wondering if, if that impact is not way too big and doesn't like diminish the creative quality of our work. Quoting a German philosopher named Georg Frank on the topic um, of the economy of attention, he already quite a while ago stated that mass media exchanges information and entertainment for attention, which is in turn monetized via advertising. And that sounds fairly obvious nowadays when you scroll down your feed and in between you have sponsored advertising, but it's something that we've grown so accustomed to that we are not necessarily questioning it anymore. And I actually believe that that structure of social media at the same time has started to have quite a significant impact on the media itself. 
he also said, overall, I argue that we are living in an era of mental capitalism in which the relations of production themselves have inverted the relationship between the material and mental worlds so that the realm of ideas is now the driving economic force. The realm of ideas can widely be described as the creative industry or the artistic expression of people. And he claims this is now the driving economic force. But at the same time, the driving economic force also means it has an impact back on the realm of ideas. Um, artists and creatives want to make a living. Um, so in order to make a living, they subconsciously cater to the economic force. Because as Google says, social media is important because it allows you to reach, nurture and engage with your target audience. Uh, social media can be used to generate brand awareness, leads, sales and revenues. And companies and marketing experts all over the world have realized that a long time ago that they can use social media influencers to generate brand awareness and sales. So while as creatives you think the likes you get on the platform or the followers you have have anything to do with the creative work, you think that's a recognition of your creative work. Ultimately, it just means that you played the algorithm of Instagram or the social media platforms correctly, and that's why you're gaining followers. Um, basically, you are kind of growing your capital of attention, and it's basically becoming a significant number within the economy of attention that could then be monetized by brands. So to believe that social media is a very neutral platform and the, the recognition you get on it is actually genuinely related to the quality, the artistic quality of your work, is in my opinion a bit of a disbelief because ultimately it just means the day your social media profile, the followers you have, is not necessarily a recognition of the quality of the artistic work. It's much more like a publicly visible bank statement showcasing your capital of attention. My personal success on Instagram is limited. I have around 4,000 followers, I think, but I also only have around 25 posts on there. I've always been kind of skeptical of the platform um, because I felt the, the shortness of the pieces and the way of consumption doesn't really allow to, to really go deep into projects or concepts or artistic works or ideas. If I look at the commercial work I did and I added together on like other accounts from the brands I worked for, then it's probably in the millions, uh, the capital of attention, but it doesn't reflect down on me as an individual who created it. But nevertheless, I was always curious about the topic because a lot of the work I do these days for clients is for social media and is also specifically for Instagram. Um, and I was wondering what does it require to become an Instagram influencer? Like what are actually the specific needs of the algorithm that you need to trigger so that you gain more followers? So I started Googling and looking up what, what actually, like what do people say you need to do? And these are um, directly taken from the internet, these tips I'm showing you now. So tip number one is like identify your niche and content pillars. Uh, you want to do a niche because you want to be known for something specific. You don't want to just post random pictures from you every day. You sort of want to have your own thing that people might be attracted to. And then at the same time, you need to be very frequently uploading stuff. So you need to ask yourself, what could I happily create consistently for a year without making any money? And as you can see, even this first tip is already tailored to potentially make money with it at some point. Tip number two, stay consistent. Consistency has on one hand to do with frequent posting. So ideally on a daily basis or at least like on a very specific days per week so that your audience knows when they will see the next post. And also consistency has a lot to do with um, the random aspect that I mentioned before. If somebody comes to an Instagram profile, they sort of want to know what they would get if they follow. They don't want to like just follow a profile and then get something completely different a few days down the line. So the consistency also has to do with predictability. The audience wants to be able to roughly predict what they will see. Tip number three is write meaningful captions because still Instagram is a meaningful platform. So whenever you post something, you need to have a meaningful caption underneath that really like communicates the depth that can be taken in while scrolling upwards on your social media feed. And focus on building a community, um, which obviously has 
to do with Instagram is still a platform for people to interact with each other. But at the same time, the algorithm um, rewards you if you just not post on a regular basis, but also comment on other people's posts. Um, post stories from time to time, reels, all these other features, the algorithm will recognize that you're active on the platform and therefore the potential of the algorithm suggesting your profile to other people is increasing. So basically all of these rules not necessarily tailor to um, what people want to see, they much more tailor to what the Instagram algorithm expects from a content creator to engage with the platform and be successful on it. And then all of that research ultimately led me to the birth of Rachel Leary. In order to understand the algorithms of Instagram, I decided to create another algorithm. Rachel is an automated algorithm that uploads images to Instagram automatically. So technically speaking, it, she is a bot. <laughs> Rachel is the world's first fully automated autonomous 3D design influencer on Instagram. Um, she started posting in May 2020 uh, to the Instagram account at Rachelic, and she's posting one new image per day. She will basically continue posting without any human intervention as long as the computer she's running on is online. That means Rachel, as I mentioned before, is a software, an algorithm that automatically creates images, visually pleasing images, and uploads them to Instagram with meaningful captions and everything that is needed to please the algorithm of Instagram. How this looks like is something like this video shows here. <laughs> Once per day, Rachel fires up on the machine that she's running on. Um, she starts creating a new image that is based on very simple design techniques. Uh, she has a variety of shapes and colors to choose from. Then she basically generates a meaningful name to the image that was just created and then uses a custom Python script to upload the image to Instagram automatically. So the question I asked before was how to become an Instagram influencer, but that quickly evolved for me to how to create an Instagram influencer. So coming back to the tips we looked at before, tip number one, identify your niche and content pillars. What could I happily create consistently for a year without making a dime? Um, I struggled with that question because I didn't feel the gain from becoming a Instagram influencer big enough for making me sit down and do the same thing every day consistently. But an algorithm can do that for you. You feed the algorithm with a certain amount of parameters and it can create a huge variety of images automatically. And they are still different enough from each other so that they work on this daily posting routine. Um, but they're also similar enough to create a feeling of consistency that people see it and they will enjoy what they see potentially, hopefully, and then they will decide to follow because they know they will see the same thing tomorrow again, just a little bit different. So Rachel automatically creates images that are based on different color palettes that are generally assumed to be visually pleasing in modern design language. She uses abstract objects, renders them in a photorealistic environment because that's my niche, so to say. It's something you don't see every day. In, if you walk on the street, you won't see an abstract object lying around there. But it's something that works really well in 3D and is generally kind of liked by people. And it has some sort of artistic notion to it by the color scheme sometimes, but it doesn't say 
enough to be offending in any sort of way or to actually need a bigger amount of attention that you kind of you know need to stop your feet and actually look at an image it's it's the perfect two seconds like image um, and then you continue your feet the consistency of rachel is very much based on the algorithm that i designed on one hand she's posting on a daily basis which means people can expect when to see the next post on the other hand, Rachel uses certain design techniques that allow for a very reliable image generation. Such design techniques are, for example, the most obvious one is a grid system in 3D that allows for the placement of objects in a very orderly fashion, but also gives you a certain amount of flexibility on how to create compositions. Tip number three, write meaningful captions. Now, meaningful is a very debatable term on a social media platform like Instagram. Um, if you only spend a few seconds with each post, then meaningful, I don't know if meaningful can be perceived as such. And also it's questionable how much is actually necessary. I think ultimately this tip refers to that it needs to look like there is a real person behind this post. And especially if the captions are a little bit more artistic or inspirational, that's perfect. So Rachel actually generates those captions independently as well. Um, she often uses words such as nature or natural or speed when the color green is used. Um, or she uses words as like silent when she doesn't use too many objects in an image. Terms such as architectural usually refer to that certain set of um, shapes. Joy is in the context of yellow, circular in the context of circular shapes, and so on. Tip number four, focus on building a community. Now, I don't really believe in that term too much because building a community does mean you have real interaction with people. And um, while, yes, we have a community on Instagram because we follow our friends, that community is from outside of Instagram and it just basically is reflected on the platform. So building community is just sort of the term in front of it, but ultimately it, it, this tip tells you what the algorithm is looking for. So first, um, and that is more on the human side of things, um, I, I intended to make the account look real, so I gave it a real name. And in the first months of posting, I also didn't tell anyone that this is an algorithm posting here. So I named her Rachel Leary. Um, after the original Blade Runner movie and Rachel in that movie is an AI, but she's not aware of her being a machine. And then engaging with the community was one of the few things that I did manually. Um, it's something that could easily be automated, but at the time I'm not a programmer, so um, I just wanted to kick off the profile. So I actually started to just randomly go to posts all over Instagram and put hearts underneath. And that's enough for the engagement to make the algorithm trigger and potentially suggest your profile to others. Now, while Rachel has not yet become the crazy Instagram influencer I would like her to be with hundreds of thousands of Instagram followers, uh, she nevertheless has reached almost 7,000 and gets new followers on a daily basis as she's posting every day. Uh, on one hand, um, obviously I'd liked her to have more, but on the other hand, it kind of made me sort of gain belief in the platform again, because uh, people seem to unfollow her as well. So it, it seems people do start to get tired of the, the same content every day. Um, but one phenomenon that I really enjoyed that started happening a few weeks ago is that the bots of Instagram um, discovered Rachel. So now whenever she posts, there's a good chance that one of the bots picks up the posts and uh, automatically posts a comment on it. So in a way, she really succeeded in building the community within her niche uh, because she's a bot posting and bots talking to her. And then last but not least, to conceptually make the piece whole, um, as I quoted Georg Frank before, he was talking about the economy of attention kind of uses attention to create money. Um, I decided to mint an NFT of some of the images that Rachel has created and it was actually sold. So the machine has created an artwork that 
somebody has deemed to have monetary value. And it was an image that consisted of 5,000 images that Rachel has created, obviously being inspired by Beeple's collage. Um, but in this case, it just took her one night and not 15 years. Or I don't know how long exactly he needed for all of his dailies. Now to conclude this talk, um, whenever we talk about AI or automated algorithms, people are really concerned of um, the idea that in the future AI will steal our jobs and we will be worthless as humans or something like that. But ultimately, looking at how um, creative work evolved in the last years and especially the one which caters to social media platforms, um, I don't even think we need to wait for the AI. If we are reducing the platforms we are using to, to very quick social media feeds and the content we are producing is satisfactory, if it's just like a mesmerizing loop of, of balls falling through, I don't know what, abstract geometry, then we are already diminishing our input as creatives, as artists, as humans, to um, a, a simplistic version of creative expression that can easily be automated today. We don't need to wait for AI. Technically speaking, Rachel is not necessarily an AI, it's an automated algorithm. And it can already create a lot of those images and content that is successful on those platforms. So I think AI in the future will not steal our jobs as long as we keep evolving as humans and, and use creative expression at the utmost highest level of human expression and not start to change how we express ourselves artistically simply to cater to algorithms that are controlled by machines. And to end on a positive note, I still think every algorithm will need a human to design it in the first place. Um, algor these algorithms don't exist yet, so somebody needs to design them to create those images. So as creative professionals, maybe our role will change more from actually creating the images or the videos will maybe change more into creating algorithms that generate those images. And that basically is the end of my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I think there's a Q&A afterwards. So if you have any questions, um, I'll be very curious to hear them. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias, for this uh, great insight into your current project. Fantastic uh, uh, remarks uh, here, uh, comments on what is uh, maybe going on in the future. And it's great to have you here at the campus Hagenberg. And uh, we can talk about uh, this uh, quite interesting project. As we have this uh, overarching topic, tectonic shift, uh, this automatic bot 3D designer, is this something that will uh, totally change uh, the production of uh, image and animation in the future? What do you think? Um, yeah, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I don't know if it, I mean, it, I, I'm pretty sure it will change it, but I think it's also part of what technology has always been for the 3D community, especially. And it's always been a substantial part that we are using certain tools that make our work easier. Uh, and I think these tools are just becoming more and more intelligent so that we can potentially automate more and more things um, further down the line. As I, as I mentioned in the end of the presentation, I don't think it's, um, it's going to replace the designer because even these tools have to be designed by someone. I think it will just potentially change the role of designers from like crafting singular images rather like craft design systems that are then automated and craft those images for you in a way. Uh, this is obvious, so uh, I think that in the last uh, 40, 30 years uh, there has been put a lot of effort to, to design new tools uh, and make these tools smarter, but on the other hand, is, is the human getting smarter as well? So as you mentioned, so it's still, it needs a human that is uh, in touch with uh, these uh, artificial intelligence tools or automated designers. Yeah, I mean, obviously the humans are getting smarter because they're able to build such things like, like AI or like all these crazy technologies, um, which is based on a lot of knowledge and research over the years. I'm not sure if in the creative fields we're necessarily getting smarter because of what I mentioned in the, in the, in the presentation, the, you know, the, the platforms are sort of encouraging really fast output of images uh, that are just like 
almost speaking to rudimental instincts of people uh, rather than spending a year thinking about a painting that will be shown in the sh exhibition next year then. Yeah, but it, I see this uh, observation in your piece so mm -hmm. that it's uh, creating meaningful sentences and meaningful images uh, uh, for uh, an audience that is uh, uh, responding to this image as well. So uh, is it, uh, of course, a critical uh, examination of how we, uh, um, yeah, See, uh, um, see these images and comment on that, and how this will be, uh, so to speak, uh, um, part of uh, the structure of the platform, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think my, my research in that context is also to, to question how much um, does an Instagram, does a platform like Instagram um, give the opportunity to creatives to create, to show something meaningful? because of the, the extremely short periods of time that people spend on posts and the format that, you know, it's not even a slideshow where you click and then you see the next piece, it's a long stream. So you're just becoming a part of a list that rushes by really fast. So that, the meaningful aspect is something I'm still not sure about. Like, is it meaningful if it's just like, looks pretty and has a nice caption or is, does meaningful need more time from an audience to actually understand the, the work? So uh, a longer duration, so you mentioned that yeah. everything is uh, getting shorter and shorter, music videos uh, and also uh, um, music itself is uh, also connected to the structure of uh, Spotify is actually tracking uh, so, and generating uh, um, money. So this is changing uh, uh, the medium itself, but at the end, uh, if, if you think about storytelling, is this something that uh, is still important if you use uh, Instagram as a, a platform to generate images? Yeah, I'm not sure if, if that's important because it doesn't work like that. A story needs a certain amount of time to actually be understood as a story. It more like captures moments or images or snapshots. Um, I think I read in a kind of funny research, which I'm not sure if it's scientifically true, but it was saying that our attention span as humans is constantly decreasing and it's now lower than a goldfish which like apparently they started comparing that. So, you know, and it's in platforms like Instagram encourage that because, because of how they are structured and how they're built. They don't want you to spend a lot of time on things. They would want you to go through a lot of things quickly so that they can put advertisement in between. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question uh, uh, from Houston Rodriguez. Question to Matthias. What language uh, did you use to build Rachel? Can you give more details about the construction, or is it a secret? <laughs> um, so Rachel is built in Unreal Engine, predominantly Unreal Engine 4. Um, besides the automation, there's some Python scripts which do the automation part. Um, but the software itself is um, fully Unreal Engine 4. And the, um, the functions inside Unreal are using the native blueprint system, which is like a visual scripting system. I'm not a programmer, so, but I love the node system in Unreal. It's pretty, pretty powerful, actually. There is another question uh, tackling uh, this uh, um, design aesthetic rules. Uh, to what extent can the automatic creation of images, even if they obey aesthetic rules and contain graphic elements, accept as aesthetically correct be considered art? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, because I'm also, I also don't know. <laughs> that was my question to myself in, with this project, you know. Is something art just because um, it, it, it looks pretty? Because, you know, I, I work in a design field for a while now and we always use certain techniques because we know they create um, visually pleasing images as I describe in my project. Um, and, and they trigger a certain kind of like a certain kind of um, attractiveness in the audience in a way. I don't know how to put it. So is that art? I don't know. I can't answer that question. That's, that, I think that's, that's a much bigger question that we are all conversing about. But my question is more like, does, does the platform even give um, the creators the possibility to show art? In, in, in this uh, direction, uh, um, I was thinking about, uh, uh, you started with Rachel, um, uh, a year ago, and uh, you already got at the beginning requests uh, for design job, as you, you mentioned. That's, that's quite interesting. Uh, of course, it's a um, um, limited uh, um, um, rule of sets, uh, of design sets for creating uh, these images. 
But I was wondering if there is um, a dialogue on the comments. Uh, is this something that uh, could be in the future influence uh, the aesthetic uh, rules for Rachel so that this is an evolving uh, system? Yeah, I mean, ultimately it, it would be totally possible. I think, I mean, in my head there are so many more possibilities um, of what Rachel could be. Um, originally I also planned that she will post animations one day. Um, she might still dive into different kind of styles or maybe there's a, another Rachel at some point. Um, so I'm still exploring that. I mean, the possibilities are endless. Um, but ultimately for me, the the more important part than, than show, having like a tech demo was to, to actually bring the concept to, to, um, to completion and actually do the, the thing of like creating an Instagram account with a real name that posts images and without anybody knowing at first this is an automated software doing it. Um, and for that I felt like I was at a point when I started releasing um, her that, that it's kind of enough for that concept. Um, she's currently not using any machine learning or anything like that. I mean, ultimately, that would be an interesting experiment because she's creating her own library. So at some point, she could potentially look at the likes on the images and then uh, start with machine learning to adapt her own algorithm more towards those which have more likes. Um, but that's, that's, that's a bigger project. <laughs> so. uh, what is quite interesting is there is a coincidence because there is uh, uh, people with a similar name, Winkelmann, uh, and he's doing uh, uh, this uh, every day since, since years, and there is also a connection uh, with uh, Rachel because you reflected with uh, this uh, 5,000 uh, image, images as a collage, and you also uh, sold it uh, as an NFT. So can you give us uh, an insight into this uh, conversation between uh, these artworks? And I'm also very interested what do you think about uh, the NFT? Because uh, at the beginning of this, uh, the year, uh, when uh, uh, people sold his uh, collage, his first 5,000 images, uh, this was really a, a kind of a tectonic shift uh, in the art world because uh, uh, everybody thought, okay, this is the future for, for media art. Uh, is this uh, something that, that you um, see as a challenge? Uh, or do you see, is it more, um, a hype, uh, more um, <laughs> something that is for for nerds. Um, oh yes, for nerds for sure. That's for sure. that's uh, <laughs> that's no question. I think I mean that's the beauty of it. I actually I love what's going on there. I'm, I'm still not sure what's my exact opinion on it, um, but I love that it's. I mean, nerds is a is a strange word, but it really feels like the digital art scene, which has always been a little bit overlooked by the traditional art scene kind of suddenly met those like crypto bankroller guys who probably can't really or well, never really dared before to just walk into a normal traditional commercial gallery and buy work. It feels like they both kind of met and realized, hey, we can build our own art scene completely independent from the other thing. And I, I love that part of it. It's such an internet thing in a way. Um, but yeah, coming back to Beeple, I mean, first of all, Beeple, um, I have so much respect for him. Um, um, I love his work and, and he's, he's literally the grandmaster of dailies. I mean. I don't know if he's, he invented it, but like he really pushed it, and I think he made it a, um, become a, a, an institution in the 3D community. Um, but the huge difference for me in, 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 in people's work is that, and I love the fact that he still has all of the images on his website, because and any, anyone who doesn't know people, I really encourage them to go to the website and, and look at the work, because you can see how he evolved. He, he always, I th in my, in my understanding, he always saw dailies as a way for him to learn more and for him to explore his own artistic language. Um, because back then when he started, I, I don't think there was Instagram yet. Uh, it was a while ago. So. Not really, yeah. I think so it's, it's five, six years ago, so with the 5,000, yeah. No, I, no. I mean, he's posting for like 15 years yeah, or 15 something. Years, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and you can really see how he evolved through doing that. So it was, for me, it was very much like in, in dialogue with himself. And he happened to post it online because, Playground yeah, because sure. it made, I, I think I heard it once in a talk, because it made him have to do things. If you post it, you have to finish it in a way. Um, and I think that's great. I think it's, a, it's an incredibly great tool to evolve your own technical skill, but also an artistic language. Um, and he's a perfect example for that. I think my comment on the dailies is more that um, especially with the advent of Instagram and the algorithm, algorithms of Instagram, um, the platform encourages 
that you post images on a daily basis, like with a certain consistency, um, because that will give you more followers. So people started to just post images on a very regular basis to get more followers. So it, it feels a bit like it, it started to miss that internal, like the dialogue with yourself on your work. Mm. It became like you just, you know, you fire up MoGraph or whatever tool it is and you, you render a few things and post it and that's it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the, the difficulty if, if your creation then is only there to please certain algorithms of a platform. Yeah. But it's a, it's a weird connection so mm -hmm. to, to see that uh, uh, people is, is doing it uh, over 15 years almost uh, uh, and Rachel can do this immediately uh, and can create uh, uh, thousands of images, uh, so this is something that is, of course, uh, in this discussion with uh, NFT quite interesting. Uh. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for the audience, if you have any questions, uh, just uh, leave your question in, in the chat and I can address it to, to Matthias. Uh, what I was also wondering is, uh, uh, you introduced yourself as a motion designer, as a 3D artist, uh, in the field of um, advertising uh, uh, and also in the art world. Uh, you did some commissioned pieces also as an art piece, so you introduced uh, uh, your uh, fantastic uh, uh, short, uh, I think five years ago, uh, here at uh, the Expanded Animation Symposium, a very um, uh, fantastic one-minute piece, I guess, so yeah. it was like, like uh, this duration. Uh, so how how do you handle this this gap between um, or this blurring boundaries between uh, doing commission uh, for uh, Microsoft and doing your own artistic work? Uh, how does this influence your artistic work? Yeah, I think it, uh, for me there is not such a huge difference between them because whenever I work with clients, I also try to find um, um, new ways and new designs and new visual languages and new expressions in a way. It's just that I'm reflecting on what the client is asking for on the brief of the client. I've, I actually barely work, like, I don't work in advertising that much. It's like, like especially not traditional one. Um, quite a lot of it is more like branding related. And branding is just basically a reflection on what the client thinks their company is or their product is or whatever it is. Um, and my work, my Personal work is quite often also a reflection. It's, it's very much a reflection. I mean, Rachel is a reflection on the circumstances of, of how, where creative work is shown these days and also where the platform I work for quite often for clients. So it's very much connected to that. Um, so yeah, I think, I think 3D artists or digital artists quite often, um, especially in motion design, have been sort of in between seats a lot because motion design, um, there's a lot of exploration involved that is quite artistic and quite free, and then ultimately you just put a logo in the end and suddenly it's a product advertisement. Um, so I've, I, never, I never really found myself very clearly um, labeled as one or the other in a way. I'll come back to uh, our starting question. Is there a kind of a tectonic shift, uh, of course, uh, uh, these tools, Instagram, TikTok, are, are changing a lot. But on the other hand, we are facing or we have new tools. Uh, is it a kind of a, a shift now? Or is it more a transition that we are facing uh, new platforms, new tools uh, in the next year, and it will always evolve and change? We talked about the duration, so there is not really <laughs> a lot of space to change because we are almost at a couple of seconds. Um, yeah, I mean, I mentioned in my presentation that I actually kind of see it more as a transition, like a, an ongoing process into something else. Um, because um, I think there's not, it, the, the medium in itself, like, in, like especially motion design, which is where I come from, that's my background, I think has, has such a wide definition that it constantly tries to adapt to new platforms and new new um, sort of arrangements. But quite often people are not aware of that it has like a 100 year old history already. Like there's actually a, you can kind of follow up where it comes from and how it developed. Um, but it has never really been recognized as, as, in my opinion, as like this entity of this is it, you know. And I feel that's also why the community, um, besides the fact that most people are very tech savvy and very into new things, 
Um, but I think that's also why it's always so flexible and constantly evolves because on one hand, there are new platforms and new technologies. On the other hand, clients always want the latest stuff and they want to be on the newest platforms because they think that's where they need to be. Um, and, and then the creatives behind it just adapt to that situation. And the pandemic has an impact on that, on, on your uh, work as well? Oh yeah, it was like, I think for pretty much everyone I know, it was like one of the busiest year ever because I mean, on one hand, the film sector um, couldn't shoot as easy as they could before. So I think um, budgets from that end actually started to triple over into the more animation sector because it feels games, a bit like, yeah. and games as well, yeah. yeah. But in the animation sector, it feels like agencies suddenly discovered, hey, there are all these, these nerds, they're sitting at home anyway, aren't they? <laughs> so for them, nothing really changes. So. Yeah, and it was uh, uh, um, already established in, 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 in production that yeah. uh, all these companies work together in virtual space, so to speak, and uh, have uh, shared folders and doing everything before the pandemic, actually. Yeah, so exactly. this was something that is, was not new for uh, the people that are working in the industry. Yeah, I think um, a lot of studios or like a lot of people actually considered um, remote work before the pandemic because it was just... Um, practical in the context of how we work. Um, my good friends of mine at, at Panoply in London, um, they, I talked with Mark and he also said like even before the pandemic, they were actually looking into moving all of their computers into a data center and close the studio and just work from wherever they are. And they, they've done that and they've been doing that and they're not yeah. planning to come back because it's not necessary. Um, Although it's kind of nice sometimes to actually <laughs> have people around you. It's so nice so. to have you here actually <laughs> and to talk with you here and have a coffee afterwards and go uh, to the uh, gala at the Ars Electronica Fe uh, Festival. So this is really something that we uh, would love to do next year to have the audience here again. And uh, as we are running out of time, thank you so much for your presentation and for, for this very nice talk. Uh, thanks thank uh, for, for the questions. Uh, we will uh, continue after uh, a 30 minute break. Yes. 6.15 p.m. Um, European uh, uh, time, Central European time. So on the website, you have the possibility, very fancy, to switch uh, to your uh, time zone, and then you see the program in your time zone. So we will continue in 30 minutes with uh, two great, uh, another great presentations uh, from artists, so to speak, uh, Nonia de la Peña and Peter Burr. Uh, both uh, have been uh, uh, awarded already at Prias Electronica, and it's, uh, yeah, you're cordially invited to join this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you.